So, so we're going to come to the last presentation, and it's Tina, who used to be in Berkeley, but I think now she's going to be speaking to us um, from, from her new professorship in Zurich. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's really exciting, Tina, that, that, uh, to, to, that you've moved and that you're set up in Switzerland, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, it's okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, well, now we can see you as well, and we can hear oh, you as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so Tina was actually um, kind of connect Cyrus and me and, and Janet in a way, because yes. you went to, on a Henry Welcome, you went to, to UCSF yes. and, and had yes. Janet as well, yeah. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, I cannot manage my own computer, which is a bit annoying, but um, but I have my laptop so I can give this talk. Uh, okay, um, so it's really an honor. First of all, it's kind of difficult not to follow Madan's talk, but it's really also an honor to, um, to give this talk because given how many amazingly successful people came out of Sarah's lab, giving this talk really feels like giving a talk at a very selective international conference. I mean, the quality of science today has been amazing. Um, so today I want to kind of give you a little bit of overview about allosteric mutations because that's uh, one of the many things Sarah and I have in common, our love for our allosteric. Um, so I was a PhD in Sarah's lab from 2008 until 2013 at LMB. And after that, um, with the mentorship of Janet, I went to as a welcome postdoctoral fellow to UCSF. And now I've started my lab as an assistant professor of biochemistry at the University of Zurich. And um, I've learned many things from Sarah, but one of the first and most important lessons, the scientific one was you have to always think outside the box if you want to do exciting science. And um, I think the box at the time in structural bioinformatics was really focusing on um, when thinking about protein interactions, focusing on protein interfaces. And while it is true that it is a couple of hotspot residues that really define the energy of interfaces, it's not individual amino acids that perform biological functions, but it's the whole proteins. So Sarah and I wanted to study the importance of structural context um, that determines oligomeric state. And um, so to do that, thanks to uh, Emmanuel's database, we found an interesting case study family, uh, a family of proteins that consists of homodimers and homotetramers, but the tetrameric interface between the dimer and the, and the tetramer was 100% conserved in sequence. So that was a perfect example uh, a case study for us to study, well, it's obviously not the mutations in the interface, it's something else that has led to this um, difference in oligomeric state. And um, working together with Cyrus and Sarah, we found that it's actually um, the difference in, in the geometry of the dimer. So the dimeric protein had the same interface as the tetrameric one, but it had a different geometry, which was not compatible with the um, with the tetramer formation. And um, then what I've done is I went to Jane Clark's lab and did experiments and we did ancestral sequence reconstruction to try and kind of uh, map um, the, the really the, the sequence changes, the mutations that occur during evolution that led to this difference in oligomeric state. And we found two very interesting things. The first was that uh, this conformational change really mimics what happens functionally with the protein as it's performing its cellular function. And second thing, which was very surprising uh, at the time, and I think it's still a surprising result, is that there are actually multiple sets of non, multiple non-overlapping sets of mutations that could uh, lead to this difference. And um, and I think uh, Joe has mentioned this morning how this. This um, Sarah's ERC proposal was not um, uh, funded. And if I counted correctly, it was three science papers and one cell paper that was published out of this unsuccessful proposal. So watch it, that's what happens when you make Sarah angry. <laughs> um, and um, 
So for my, so it's basically our main finding was um, that is uh, it's the it's the context that of the rest of the protein that really determines whether this helix is an interface um, or um, or a surface in the protein. And uh, for my postdoc, I kind of stayed with the theme of the importance of context. And uh, so there I focused on this question of, uh, of protein function uh, and how do we think about it? So protein function is actually a combination of its molecular mechanism that we can study biochemically in a buffer, but it's also this molecular mechanism is embedded in the context of the entire cellular network. And as you can see, this, this way of thinking was really um, influenced and shaped by, uh, by being trained by Sarah. Um, so for my postdoc, I again found a very interesting case study of a small GTPase protein that exists in, in two states. So it's a very simple two-state switch, but that nevertheless performs uh, many, um, many very essential uh, uh, roles in the cell. So, um, so it's very normally very difficult to study uh, such proteins with classical tools of reverse genetics. Because if you delete such a, uh, such a gene, you have really deleted all of its uh, functions at the same time. Um, so my idea was to try and make mutations that will perturb individual functions of this protein and, and, uh, and study them one at a time to try to kind of deconvolute how can one, one two state switch regulate so many things in the cell at the same time. Um, and I've done that by, um, by making point mutations in, uh, in the interfaces of this small GTPase, and then doing a lot of proteomics and genetic interaction screens. And now to kind of crunch a lot of uh, data, uh, of a lot of uh, genetic interaction and proteomics data, this is basically the, the main result that we found, is that we found two groups of mutations. So one group of mutations was um, having phenotypes that were similar to the deletions of genes that are involved in nuclear transport and genes that are involved in cell cycle regulation, so spindle assembly regulation. And the second set of genes were, um, uh, the second set of mutations were similar to the deletions, again, of the genes involved in nuclear transport, but also genes involved in RNA modification, but not genes involved in spindle assembly regulation. And, um, and as I said, these mutations were interface mutations, so they were nowhere close to the active site. They were nowhere close to the canonical switch one and switch two regions of, of this GTPase. Um, but I couldn't, no way how I kind of analyzed the data and the proteomics or the genetic interactions, I couldn't really explain this, this two sets of mutations by trying to group them by in which interface they were. And um, so uh, remembering my PhD training and the importance of Austrian proteins, I then checked, well, do these mutations, although they're on the surface and far away from the active site, do they actually allosterically affect the kinetics of the GTPA switch? And now to not show you a lot of uh, biochemistry that I've done, uh, the answer was yes, actually all of them. And to paraphrase, uh, a great biochem is John Curian. If you're studying proteins and you don't see any alister, you're not doing a very good job. Um, and so um, most of this uh, work during my postdoc was a lot of um, high throughput genetic interaction screening and proteomics, but actually to really look at the details of, um, uh, of the alister, uh, uh, we, we used, we used um, a very simple uh, structural uh, method, uh, which is actually one dimensional NMR. So it's something you don't really even need a computer to analyze the data. So um, with 1D NMR, uh, what you can see is you can um, measure the spectrum of phosphorus and there's only three phosphate um, atoms, phosphorus atoms in, in a protein. Uh, and th those are the three uh, phosphorus atoms from, from the GTP. And you can see that the alpha and the beta uh, phosphorus, we can see one clear peak, but the gamma phosphorus is always uh, split into two peaks. And that is because the GTP bound conformation is actually two subconformations, 
One is the kind of active signaling conformation and the other one is the one that's primed for GTP hydrolysis. And when we've recorded this spectra for our mutants, we could see that we can really titrate between those two conformations with our mutants from mutants that are 100% in this gamma one conformation to the mutants that are 100% in gamma two conformation. Um, and when we plotted this um, simple uh, uh, NMR spectra against the, our kinetic data, we got a perfect linear correlation. I mean, this looks really like something that you could put in Alan First's textbook. Um, but so to now go back to, to our, uh, to our um, phenotype, um, so we have these two groups of mutations and can we explain now these two groups with the GTP cycle parameters and the answer was yes. So the, basically the group one mutations were all the mutations that allosterically slow down the gap part of the cycle. And the group two mutations were the ones that allosterically slow down the gap part of the cycle. Um, and, um, and so, and for, but it seems like for the nuclear transport role of, of this GTPs, uh, both sides of the cycle are important. So it's actually the cycle balance that defines the cellular function of, nuclear, of running nuclear transport. Um, and so kind of this really um, um, answer to me, at least contributed to the uh, really fundamental answer is how, do you, how can you have one simple switch protein that regulates so many, multi, so many cellular processes at the same time? Um, so one is we shouldn't forget about the allosteric. So um, we kind of think about this switch that switches between two states and then it binds all these, um, all these um, uh, uh, downstream effectors, but it's actually the, the interfaces with these uh, downstream effectors uh, also have small allosteric effects. So a two state switch is actually a very complicated switch. Um, and the second thing is, well, yes, we think about this as a two-state switch when we think about it biochemically, when we think about it in the buffer, but actually when you put it in the context of a cell, different uh, other cellular processes can sense one switch in different ways. So nu in, for nuclear transport, this one switch is um, sensed as a kind of a, cycle, a balanced cycle. Uh, for the spindle assembly checkpoint role, it's actually sensed as an off switch. And for RNA processing and some other uh, processes, it's actually sensed as an on signal. Um, and just to end this talk, I want to share with you some top lessons I learned from Sarah when I was her student. Um, first lesson is it's really okay to be overly excited about cool results. Like don't ever forget that. It's not, it's not weird. Um, second really important role, uh, rule that I've learned is that you just, some people are just not worth listening to. <laughs> and uh, you should kind of be careful whose advice you're taking. And third one, I think a lot of people have mentioned this, it's always be kind to everyone. And I think uh, with Sarah, it's really clear that kindness is not something passive. Kindness doesn't mean like don't do anything wrong. Kindness really means kind of reach out to people and be active and speak up when something is wrong. Uh, the fourth thing is make sure you always end your talk with three take home messages. So oops, this was my fourth one. And, um, and of course, from that follows the fifth one, which is you don't always have to follow rules. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I would like to thank you. Um, and of course, um, Sarah, um, I, uh, I think you gave birth uh, six days. Um, to Maya six days before my PhD interview and I think I only had 15 minutes and you asked me a bunch of questions and um, I think I answered them and um, many times I thought I'm really happy that I didn't like freeze and mess up that interview because those 15 minutes really changed my life um, and um, a lot of people many of whom are here uh, Madan who was really there for me when I was looking for postdoc positions and when I was looking for faculty positions. Um, and um, then I will just stop reading down this list because I will get too emotional. Um, thank you all. Jane, Jane is here too in the oh, audience. Oh, Jane. And I think Janet is here too and Natalie. Yeah, Janet is on Zoom.
Okay, good. <laughs> Jane, is, Jane is physically in person. Hi, Jane. Hi, lovely to see you. Yeah, it's true that um, I think it was a week or, or 10 days after I gave birth to Maya that I went in and did Tina's interview. And when I arrived, I realized that I had my slippers on because I took a taxi because I wasn't walking very comfortably. I took it or cycling. Cycling was just out of the question. And, and I arrived and I realized I had my slippers on and I just put them under the table. She didn't, she didn't seem to notice. They were the Birkenstock type, but it was the middle of the winter or like January. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I know. I, I noticed you had sweatpants on, and they were ripped in the back. That's what I noticed. <laughs> too much information, guys. Too much information. <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> um, questions for Tina. Allosteric mutations. Um. <laughs> I will, I'll connect my, my computer and, and I'll finish up. Um, I mean, the, the crowd who's here, Tina, the crowd who's here in person is not too expert on the allosteric mutation and kind of 3D structure front um, from, you know, the people from my group nowadays, but, but there are people on the Zoom who should no, be no, able I, to. I just know what she's gonna do in her new lab. Uh, okay, so, so Jane wants to know um, what are your plans for your own lab over the coming years in broad terms? Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, keep doing functional genomics. So I'm going to keep doing genetic interactions and uh, really ask these questions. How do you have these um, uh, simple biochemical uh, mechanisms and how do they encode um, complex, uh, complex phenotypes? So a lot of signaling a lot of biochemistry of signaling molecules and a lot of uh, CRISPR screens in my future. Was that, was that a good enough, Jane? I'm sorry. 